Hey, this is Flo from Flo Dev. This amazing visualization has been making its rounds on LinkedIn and other platforms, and I thought we'd take a look at what is actually going on here. It was made by Anki Johani. The link is in the description. So on top we see traffic coming in, and it's going to Route 53, a DNS service that resolves the domain and routes it to the appropriate CloudFront distribution. In between, we see AWS Web Application Firewall, or WAF, this will filter common web exploits such as SQL injection or cross-site scripting. We could add AWS Shield for more protection against bots and DDoS, but here the author chose not to do that. The CloudFront distribution is then connected to what we call a standard three-tier architecture, with a web or front-end tier, an application or back-end tier, and the database tier. On the left side, we see the three-tier setup sits in a single VPC, a virtual network on the region US East 1. The VPC will give us a common network address space, just like an on-premise network would. On the left and right, we see the VPC spans two availability zones, which we can imagine as different data centers of AWS. This offers better fault tolerance should one AZ have problems. The entry point for the data is an elastic load balancer, which is always in an active-active configuration. That means both availability zones are used by default. We'll see an example of an active passive config in a bit. The Elastic Load Balancer then sends the data to EC2 instances, the AWS virtual machines, in an auto scaling group. The auto scaling group automatically increases or decreases the number of EC2 instances based on load. We can, for instance, target an average load of 80%, and if we go above, ASG will add more instances. So the website code running on the web server EC2 instances will send their request to the app servers or sometimes called backend servers. The backend servers can then contact the database tier on the bottom. Here, the author chose Amazon RDS. This database service supports many popular SQL databases such as MySQL, SQL Server, or Postgres. We see that we have separate subnets for each tier and availability zone. This is considered best practice as it gives us separation. So, instances within one subnet could communicate with each other, but nobody from the outside can access them, unless explicitly allowed. In this case, the load balancers have security group or access control list settings to be able to talk to the instances in the subnet. On the top, we see two public subnets. This means they have connectivity to the internet, unlike the other private subnets. This is considered best practice in order to access the instances in private subnets for administration purposes. Inside sit two NAT gateways. The NAT gateways will be used if private instances want to communicate with the outside world, such as getting security patches and updates. We also have a bastion host, which is good for administration in general. We also see two AWS backup instances, to which the web and application servers can send important data to a backup vault. If we zoom out again, we see that on the right, we have the region US West 2 with an identical setup in a so-called active-passive configuration. That means the CloudFront service on the top will only send data to this region when the primary region fails. This allows for extreme fault tolerance, the so-called five nines, which is 99.999%, or an average maximum downtime of 5.2 minutes per year. In order to make this possible, the backup vault we talked about is performing a constant cross-region backup. And the backup vault on the other region uses Backup Restore to keep the web and application tier up to date. The same goes for the database tier. We see the RDS has an active and secondary instance in one region that is again connected to the other region via a cross-region replica. That means we always have an up-to-date database instance standing by. With such a setup, we can indefinitely scale in case our demand goes up. At the same time, every single component can fail, and if it fails, we'll be replaced by something else. This could be either something on an instance level. If they fail, there will be other instances that are available, and the auto-scaling groups will make sure that there is new instances to use. If there is something more severe and the availability zone fails, we have a different one in the same region. And if that's not enough, if the entire region goes out, there is this active-passive failover on the CloudFront distribution that will just switch to a different region with the same setup. Such a setup is considered best practice at the moment for large corporations or when you really have a need for fault tolerance. 
And that's quite a bit of extra cost because depending on how quickly you want it to be able to kick in, you need to have quite some infrastructure standing by that is unused. But on the other hand, all the auto scaling will automatically scale things up in a crunch. This can take a few minutes, however. So if you need absolutely no downtime in between and want the regions to switch over directly, you should maybe choose an active active configuration here as well. This has been Flo from Flo Pro Dev. If you found this video helpful, give it a like and subscribe to stay updated on new AWS features.